Okay, everyone, let's get started. Uh, bring this up. So we'll probably have a little bit of a disruption. Uh, we have someone from OIT coming to check on a problem I'm having with the smart board. So I may or may not be able to lecture through that. But at any rate, let's get started. So this is, hopefully you're here for either CS465 or CS565. This is a combined undergraduate graduate course in databases and scripting languages. My name is Brad van der Zanden. I'm the instructor for the course. And today, basically, is just kind of an introductory day to talk a little bit about the logistics of the course, my teaching philosophy, and a little bit of an introduction to databases today. And we'll plunge into the, I guess, main stuff starting next Tuesday. So to kind of give you an idea of what the course is about, it's kind of a two-headed monster. So the first half of the course is databases, and the second half of the course is scripting languages. The reason that we have two topics in the course is we feel it's important to offer uh, both topics in our curriculum, but we do not have enough resources or time to either offer a full semester of databases or a full semester of scripting languages, hence the two courses. And there is a bit of overlap uh, between uh, the scripting languages and databases, but quite frankly, it will kind of be seem like two courses to you. So the first half will be on databases, and there will be three aspects to it. There will be the theory behind databases, and in this class we'll be using relational databases, so we'll be doing the theory. And if you wonder about the prerequisite for this course, which is uh, CS311, that is kind of necessary in order for you to really get the mathematical foundations of relational databases. We'll talk about how you design uh, databases, and there's a number of uh, ways you can do it. One is called normalization, one is called entity relationship diagrams. Don't worry about the terms, we'll get there soon enough and also how you improve efficiency through the use of what are called indices. And finally, we'll be talking about hands-on experience using MySQL, which is a public version of the most widely used uh, database uh, out there, which is SQL. In fact, it's kind of going to be first hands-on experience, then theory, then design. But these are the three major topics we'll cover in the first seven weeks of the course. Then in the second seven weeks we pivot to scripting languages and we cover three different scripting languages. So first we cover Perl, which is widely used for doing data extraction, preparing reports, kind of as a general purpose language. Python is also commonly used as a general purpose scripting language. We cover Python in CS365, which is why we do not cover it in this course. And then we go into web-based programming, which involves two languages, PHP and JavaScript. So there's two sides to web programming. One is the client side, where you're using the browser, and the other is the server side, where it is responding to requests you make from the browser. So for example, if you are purchasing something from Amazon, the interface that you use from Amazon on your browser is the, what we call the client side. What Amazon is doing on the back side in order to fulfill your order is being done on Amazon server machines, and that is the server side. So web-based programming actually involves two components, developing a client and developing the server to, side to respond to the client. And typically, those two sides are written in different languages. PHP is used for doing the server-side scripting, and JavaScript is used for doing the client-side scripting. Now, there's plenty of other languages that are used as well, for both client-side and server-side scripting, but these are the two most popular languages and hence the ones we will cover in this class. So we spend about seven weeks on 
these three languages, so about two and a half weeks on each of them. Obviously, in that amount of time, you don't become an expert in any of them, but you will become somewhat familiar with the most common parts of them. In fact, there's an old adage about 20% of the effort getting you 80% of the return, and then the remaining 80% of effort getting you the final 20% of return. And so I think this is a bit like that. With the two and a half week introduction, you kind of get 80% of the language, and then you can spend a lot more time delving into the more subtle aspects of the languages that might get you the remaining 20%. So you'll come out of here with a good um, basis for programming in those three scripting languages. So that's what the course covers. And as I said, it will seem like a bit of a uh, shift when we go from databases to scripting languages. Only in PHP do you really deal with a database. So certainly Amazon, when it's doing its order fulfillment, it's dealing with back-end databases. So we'll come back a little bit to databases when we get to PHP toward the end of the semester. Okay, so that's kind of what the course is like. As for logistics, um, the, my office is in Mingau 312, and while I have office hours from 3 to 4 there, I'm probably going to modify them to 3.30 to 4.30 simply because I know that Classes let out on Tuesdays at 3.30, so probably easier. There's spaces up here. Um, so I'll probably modify that to 3.30 to 4.30. And then Wednesdays, uh, 2.30 to 3.30. Then my email, please only send personal things like needing to miss an exam. We have a discussion forum, Piazza, where you can uh, post questions about homework assignments, about exams, about lecture, and I'll get to that in a moment. We have two TAs for the course, Raihan Pathan and Kevin Chang. Raihan is the graduate TA for the course. Kevin Chang is an undergraduate TA. They'll both have grading and office hours. Um, their contact information is on the course website. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, if you have a late request for a homework assignment, please send it to Raihan, not to me. The answer will probably be no, but in exceptional cases, he may grant it. Exceptional cases are things like you have a parent who is ill and you're physically out of town for a week. Okay, it's not that my poor dog is suddenly got um, stomach problems and I had to take the poor deer to the vet and I wasn't able to finish my homework assignment. That's not going to cut it. So, as I said, I've told him for the most part to say no to late requests, but if you have an exceptional one, he might say yes. Here's the most important URL for this um, course. It is the course website where you will find most everything. So, it's worth writing that down, although you can also find it on the website. All these slides are posted. So, you'll find general course information there the assigned readings, the lecture slides, homework assignments. I'll show it to you in a moment. Then we use Piazza for course announcements and discussions. So that's why I said only send certain personal email to me. For the most part, any questions you have, you'll post to Piazza. And we use Blackboard in the class for homework and project submissions. Yes, I know we are transitioning to Canvas, but for this semester, at least, we're going to continue to use Blackboard in this course and let the rest of the university work out the kinks in uh, Canvas for us. Okay. Textbook is Connolly and Big. Quite frankly, whether you get the 6th edition, whether you get the 5th edition, whether you get the 4th edition, whether you get the international edition, I don't care. Um, what I do care is that certain of the problems are based on the 6th edition. If you get another edition of the textbook, then ask someone on Piazza to please map, or um, it's fine to, have, to post the um, 
textbook problems on Piazza, just scan them and put them up there, but I'm not going to do that, okay? That's just, if someone may be friendly and do it for you. So that's the only thing about getting an earlier edition of the book is there may not be an exact mapping of the problems from the sixth edition to earlier editions. But quite frankly, the material in the book has not changed very much from the fourth to the fifth to the sixth edition. It's mostly exotic stuff that we don't cover in this class. Okay, grading is the normal scale here at UT. Sometimes I curve a bit, usually on the lower part, almost never on the upper part, and can give pluses and minuses for uh, if you're at the upper or lower end of the range. Your grade for the course is computed as follows. It's different for undergraduates and graduate students. The reason is graduate students have a database project. It would be great if we could also have a database project for undergraduate students, but we have too many people in the course and too few TAs. So basically, the size of the course, unfortunately, constrains what I'm able to do. And um, we can have a project for the graduate students, but unfortunately, we just don't have the resources to have a project for undergraduates. So that shows the grade distribution. You'll notice quizzes. So every day, or every lecture rather, has a Blackboard quiz associated with it, except for today. There is no quiz for today's class. But starting next Tuesday, there is a Blackboard quiz that for Tuesdays is due the following Thursday at 1230. And for the Thursday lectures, is due the following Tuesday at 1230. So basically, you have a quiz after each class, and it's due at 12.30 before the next class. So those of you who've had quizzes from me before know that I usually make them do within 48 hours, but um, I've had feedback that a lot of students kind of forget about the Saturday when they're due on Saturday, so I figured I'd experiment with just making them always do right before class starts. So two days for the Tuesday quizzes, five days for the Thursday quizzes. And the idea is just to make you quickly review the material after class because research shows that if you rehearse the material um, shortly after it is presented, it really helps cement it in your mind. So the quiz is pretty easy. They're generally 20 minutes. A few of them are 30 minutes, but they just go over basic concepts from class and um, will help, as I say, cement the material in your mind plus the quizzes are often, uh, the questions are very similar to the questions on the midterm. Again, because the midterm, or because of the size of this class, I have to use a lot of multiple choice and multiple answer questions on the midterm and on the final. Okay, key dates. The first midterm and only midterm will be on Thursday, October 13th, which is a week after fall break, and it will just be over databases. And then the final is on Wednesday, December 7th. It will just be over scripting languages. So it's really the final is just like a second midterm. And for the graduate students, the projects are due November 12th at 6 a.m. That's not a typo. That is really the evening of November 11th. But for those of you who are night owls, it gives you the morning to hack away at it. Okay, and I'll say much more about the graduate projects when they actually are assigned. I don't actually assign it until we're pretty much done with databases, which is the first week of October. Okay, so let's just take a look at the course website. So... Remember, Piazza, make sure that you sign up for it as soon as possible because, again, I don't make my announcements through Blackboard. I make all class announcements through Piazza, so expect you to have subscribed to Piazza. And this is where if you have questions about homework assignments, if you have questions about lecture, questions about exams, about the sample exams, 
or what's going to be on the exam, please post it to Piazza. That way I can respond to it, one of the TAs can respond to it, or another student in the class can respond to it. So, one second. Having trouble with the pen? Yes. Okay, so getting back to where we were. So, make sure that you sign up for Piazza and also, while there are office hours, the best way to get in touch with us outside of office hours is via Piazza. Also, know that evenings and weekends, you're not as likely to get responses. The TAs have their own course activities they need to catch up with over the weekend. I have a family that I like to see over the weekend. So, um, over the weekend, at, and at evenings, your best hope of getting something is from another student seeing your question and responding to it. So please um, do try to answer other students' questions if you can. At the end of the semester, when I'm looking at bumping up grades for people who are on the border, that's one of the things I look at is how much you participated with Piazza. It's one of the factors that goes into it. Um, if you have a question about the homework that requires you to post code. Please do that. There's an option in Piazza that allows you to post it so that only instructors can see it. Please do that if you're posting code. Okay, But if it's just a general question about the homework, please put that out there where everyone can see it. Because usually if there's one person asking the question, there's 10 other people who are wondering about the same thing and just didn't have the courage to ask. Okay. So, you have, on this one, you have assigned readings for the class. When homeworks are assigned, have the homework assignment, and when it is due. I started experimenting last semester with making assignments due at 6 a.m., and it was very popular, so I'm continuing that. So, when you see Friday... September 9th at 6 a.m. What that really means is Thursday evening, September 8th. But you can work through the night if you like and submit it up to 6 a.m. on Friday. What I really don't want to hear is, oh, I thought the due date was Friday. I didn't realize it was at 6 a.m. That's why I'm making a big deal of it now. Okay, so all assignments are due at 6 a.m. Late policy is as follows. If you turn it in more than 24 hours in advance, you get 5% extra credit. Okay, that's my way of giving you extra credit. And also, if there's any problems, it gets you, I get to hear about it early because people are trying to finish the homework assignment early. You can hand in the assignment up to three days late. For each day that is late, it's a 10-point deduction. So if you hand it in, Three days late, you, the most you can get is 70 points for the assignment. Undergraduates who are enrolled in CS465 may work in pairs if you like. Graduate students must work by themselves. Okay, so that's one of the things that differentiates the difficulty of the course. I have made it clear with the first homework assignment, but I will say it now again. If you're working in pairs, then when you submit your homework assignment on Blackboard, we want you in the comments box of the Blackboard submission to say who you're working with. So it's a lot harder for the TAs to deal with if you have put it into the homework assignment itself. It's very easy for the TA to miss it. So please, in the comments section of Blackboard, I can show you it's important enough that I'm going to show you what I mean. So there's homework submissions link and when you go to it you click And unfortunately on mine, because I'm a professor, it's not showing the comment box. Darn it. Oh, there it is. 
it says add comments. That is where you should be putting the information about who your partner is, if you have one. Okay. For the first homework assignment, we also ask that you include your major. I know it's redundant with the attendance sheet that's going around, but just in case we miss anyone today, it will help us. Um, and that's also shown in the first homework assignment, which you actually don't have to worry about until about September 2nd, but nonetheless telling you about it now. Okay, so it's under there. If you look at the general instructions for homework one, it just also reiterates it. So if you forget between now and then, hopefully that will remind you. Okay, so I also post notes like the logistics slides for today are already up there. In fact, the slides for the entire semester are already up there. I also record lectures and post my lectures at the end. This actually is a lecture from a previous semester, but after today, there'll be today's lecture up there. So that way, if you miss class, please don't ask me what you missed. Just watch the lecture. And also, it can help when you're reviewing for an exam or when you're going over homework assignments, etc. So this class, unlike many of my classes, actually is primarily lecture. It turns out to be, for those of you who've had me for 102 or for 365, you know I like to flip a classroom. I can't really do it easily in here. It's, it would kind of lend itself to it, but it's just the class is too big, and so this class tends to be more lecture. Sometimes I do have you work exercises in class, so it is helpful to bring a laptop with you because certainly uh, when we go over SQL or sometimes when we're going over some of the scripting languages, I do actually ask you to try to um, work some short exercises. So please do try to bring a laptop with you to class. See. Homework, as I said, um, gone over that. Graduate student project. Actually, I've already posted the information about it, but you really can't get started until early uh, October on it. Here we have the information about the TAs and their office hours. So if the uh, Brian tells me that usually the most common reason for someone to come to his office hours is to complain about their grade on the homework assignment, so be it. That is your opportunity to go and complain. Also, you can send him email. Um, because the class is so big, basically he doesn't have time to correct your syntax if it's wrong. He can't, he's got to grade roughly 70 assignments in about 10 hours, which is less than 10 minutes per assignment. In fact, less than that because he has office hours. So he just doesn't have time to go and fix syntax errors. So if something doesn't work, he's just going to give you a zero. And then you can say, hey, if I just changed this one thing, it would have worked, and he'll give you points back. So. Just because you get a zero, it may be that if you had just altered something a little bit, it would have worked. So it's worth, in that case, trying to get some points back from him. Yes? Is there any specific platform we need to target? Mm. I'm assuming we have, we're have going to be generating SQL statements. So. Yes. So question was, is there any specific platform we need to make sure it runs on? Hydra. So... You're going to get databases well, in a week. I was assuming specific databases. Yeah, SQL. So well, we're, we're going just just we're going to create SQL that the lab staff is creating SQL databases for you. They should be ready next Tuesday. So basically, whatever you create needs to run in that database. Okay, so those databases will be running off of. Um, which Department. Has, pardon? You know which engine has that? No, it's a uh, variation of MySQL. Basically, anything that MySQL supports, this engine supports. 
It's not a true MySQL engine, though. So you can ask lab staff. They always tell me, and I always That's forget. Like right. Just make sure it runs on the Hydra machines, and you okay. will be good. <laughs> okay. That's that's the bottom line. That's that's what Ryhan will be using to grade your assignments. He will have his Ryhan database. He will run it on the Hydra machines, and that's where it should work. So feel free to put your own SQL server on your machine, but then test it. Same thing when we get to Perl and PHP. Um, make sure it runs on that on the department's machines. Okay, because. One thing is the lab staff is really conservative, and usually the release version that's on our machines is like a year or two old. Okay, so I, the biggest problem we get is someone runs like Perl 6.2, and we have like Perl 5.7 or something, and 6.2 and 5.7 are really different. And so uh, you, you got to make sure it runs on the department's machines because that's what he's going to use. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, let's see. Ah, so the required textbook is for um, the database one. I don't recommend that you get a book for the scripting languages if you just must because you just have to have a reference book. I've listed some ones that I've found useful in the past. The editions pile up quickly, so it's better if you can to get a more recent edition, but there's so much material online that I think you're just better off um, going online. For example, W3Schools is free, and I think it has a lot of good stuff. I think my notes are pretty comprehensive. So my recommendation is not to buy a scripting languages textbook if you um, can at all avoid it. Okay. Let's see. Believe that does it. Any questions thus far? Yes. I still need to drop new quizzes. Mm-hmm. Going to drop three. I believe. Three quizzes is what I settled on. Undergraduates, da da da, d, d, d quizzes, blah blah blah. There it is. I will be dropping your three lowest quiz scores at the end of the semester. And one important thing the university shuts down on September 1st so that um, they can handle all the traffic associated with the game that night. For those who, who don't know, the first game of the season is against Appalachian State on Thursday, November 1st, so they've shut the university on that day, which I think is a great idea because the traffic will be hellacious. And engineering day is October 20th. Now, since I have video lectures, that's not good news for you all, because that means I can assign a lecture from a previous semester, and I shall. So there's actually video lectures on both September 1st and October 20th, and there are quizzes for those two days. So just because class is canceled doesn't mean there's not a video lecture for that day. That, uh, if you look over here, at lecture notes, let's see. Oh, I thought I had it up there. Is that it? Nope. Huh. Well, there will be a lecture for 9 1. Pardon? And then you'll notice 10 20. There it is online video on regular expressions. So, I will also get the lecture up for 9.1 on SQL data manipulation. Still right. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Lecture. Thank you. Lecture for 9.1 joins and updates. So it is already up there. Okay. Other questions? Yes. 
No. <laughs> it didn't seem to be a very popular choice, so we'll be back to using uh, the uh, paper-based way of doing things. Let's put it this way. It is very popular on my end. It uh, made grading amazingly simple, but it just wasn't popular on your end as judged by student evaluations. So you try, you fail, you move on. <laughs> Other questions? OK. Sit back, relax, enjoy. Actually, I guess one or two of these questions could end up as multiple choice on an exam. That, uh, but for the most part, these notes are up there already under database terminology, chapter one. I just want to go over kind of the basic stuff today before we dive into the rest of it on Tuesday. So today, some basic terminology. Next Tuesday, we talk a little bit about design of databases, and then on Thursday, we plunge right into it with MySQL and doing some um, actual programming with databases. I find it's easiest to do it that way, and it has worked out well in the past. Okay, so to date, most of you in classes here at UT have done file manipulation. Okay, you get, write a program, you do open the files using some kind of open command, you read them in using get line in C++ or CN or fscanf or something. Okay, so that is not a particularly common way to actually store information in the real world. It works well for the small homework assignments or small projects that you may do on your own, but for corporate um, systems, for engineering systems, for science systems, it's much better to keep that data in some kind of structured format. And the most common way to do that is with a database. There, if you're using a scripting language, you still may do that, or you may use a standard like XML or some other markup language. So we will talk about that a bit when we get to scripting languages, how you can store data that way. But easily the most popular way to organize and store information in the real world is via a database. So when you buy something from Amazon. Amazon is using a database to track your credit card, to track its inventory, to keep track of the invoice. Um, when you go to make an airline reservation, the airlines are keeping track of their flights and keeping track of your ticket information using a database. Uh, if you're a property management firm, then you're keeping track of your rental properties, keeping track of your clients and your owners and your leases using a database. And in fact, the textbook uses the running example of a property management company throughout its uh, um, thing. So by the end of this class, not only may you be well informed about databases, but you might want to apply to a property management rental company, since you'll probably also be familiar with the ins and outs of that. Mm -hmm. So a database is a structured collection of related data and its description. And what it means by description is its type information and fields. So in a program, you declare variables, right? Int A, string B. That's a description of your data in a program. So similarly, in a database, you have basically three elements, something called a DDL, something called a DML, 
and then you have your access control. So the DDL is the data description language. Okay, and it allows you to define the structure of your database. Basically, it's where you declare your records. Okay, so you might have a property and you would declare things like the street address. Maybe that's a string. You declare its monthly rental rate, probably a floating point number. You uh, declare its owner, probably first name and last name, probably two more strings. So the data description language is basically where you specify your various records. We in, tend to call them tables. The fields within those records, the data types of those records, and it also is where you place constraints on the data. So for example, you may have a constraint that no person makes more than $100,000 or that no realtor may handle more than 50 properties. So those are so-called integrity constraints. So that's all the data description language. Okay. The DML is your data manipulation language. And it is a query language. that allows users, uh-oh, talk about breaking a pen, uh-oh. Wish you'd left that other pen. Okay, that allows the user to insert, delete, find, and update information. So the data description language is kind of the programmer side. So this is kind of the programmer side of things. Anyone happen to have tape? <laughs> no? Hmm. Okay. I think in that case, what I'm going to have to do. Okay, that's so this is user, this is programmer. So when we talk about design, that is when we will be talking about how you create the database, and that is something that, so the designer uses the DDL to build the database. The user is using the DML to insert information, store information, update information. So the first thing we do in this class is teach you the DML. Then we later talk about design, which is the DDL. Okay, and since my pen is not going to work any longer, go to here. So the third element is access control. And there's a whole bunch of concepts associated with access control. So first of all, security. We don't want people breaking in and stealing credit card numbers. Okay, so um, database systems provide a layer of security. They provide integrity, meaning that they ensure that the data is stored consistently. And a big part of that is trying to avoid storing data multiple times. So for example, 
it's bad if my salary is stored in two different places in the database because it makes it easy to update one part of the database with a new salary and forget to update the other part. So databases do their best to avoid redundant data. That's how they ensure consistency. Third big thing is concurrency. It's important, like for Amazon, for multiple people to be able to access the database simultaneously. Okay, Think how big Amazon could have grown if it required sequential access to the database. Huh? Would be a tiny company right now if one person at a time could access its database. So concurrency is really important. Recovery control. There are times when things go wrong. The hardware crashes. Something happens with the software. Maybe an internet connection breaks while you're in the middle of doing a order with Amazon. Or while you're doing that order with Amazon, your wife finds a better deal at eBay, and you break the order. Whatever the reason, sometimes there are what we call transactions that are in the process of updating the database when something is aborted, and we need to be able to recover or roll back to a consistent previous state. So databases provide that. User accessible catalog, we already talked about that. That's essentially the DDL. It describes how the data is stored in the database, and finally, views. So it's not necessary that everyone have the same view of the database. So if I'm a manager, I need to see more information about employees than my subordinates. So for example, I might have access to their salaries, whereas the subordinates don't. So there might be a view for a manager, for a salesperson, for the CEO, and each of those views will contain different information. So they provide security because you only want certain classes of users to be able to see certain information. Another great example is Blackboard. Okay, I'm able to see information about you all on Blackboard that you can't see about each other in this course. So my view and the TA's view of the data in this course is different from your view of it. Your view is more restricted. Okay, so it allows customization. We can give certain fields more meaningful names. Okay, a common thing in views is that they actually contain summary information that's not actually stored in the database. For example, a view might give the number of properties managed by each branch of our realty firm. Well, that information is latently available if we count up all of the rental properties that is managed by each firm, but we don't actually keep those numbers there. Every time we want that information, we run a query that does the count. Okay, so the view in this case contains a field, the number of um, rental properties per office that's not even in the database. So that's customization. Okay, And then the data abstraction, we're hiding um, changes to the data that don't affect you. So for example, if the um, this isn't something that happens in this course, but let's say I only made the project description available to graduate students, then that would be something graduate students cared about, but the undergraduate students don't care about. So really, um, those of you who are undergraduates in this class really don't even need to see the graduate project. Now, I've made it available to both of you, but if it was a database, I could set it up so only graduate students would see that. And that would hide um, information from the undergraduates, but they really don't care about it anyhow. And finally, it can reduce complexity because users only need to worry about the data that they care about. So this is all very nice. And you may think, well, it's also going to be pretty complicated when 
we introduce files in CS102, they are pretty simple. This is all really requires a lot of stuff. And yes, it does. In fact, this all this access stuff we really won't talk about in the course because we don't have time for it. We'll talk about views and we'll talk about the user catalog the re and we'll talk about integrity, but the rest of it is pretty complicated. A lot of research papers have been published about it, but we won't talk about it. They are covered in depth in the textbook and we just don't have time to go into them. So certainly a much simpler thing is just to use simple file-based systems, what you're already familiar with. But those things have a lot of drawbacks in the real world that you should be familiar with. First of all, if you just maintain stuff in a file, then it's very easy for different departments to keep the data separately and it's hard to combine. So for example, the lease department in a property management company is going to keep information about leases and the sales department is going to keep information about properties that they're renting. Well, the sales department sometimes needs to know about leases. Kind of important to know which of your properties are empty and which are actually being rented, right? And how might we determine that? By a lease. So it would be good if you could combine the information from the two departments. But if you keep them separately, that can be difficult to do. They might be on different servers, for example. Okay, so that's a problem. Um, another problem, so that's what we call separation and isolation of data. The second one is duplication of data. So maybe it's just too much of a pain in the neck for the sales department to always go and ask the lease department about vacant properties, so the sales department keeps its own information. So someone comes in, modifies the lease, and the leasing office forgets to tell the sales office that they extended the lease for two years. So I'm the salesperson. I am all set. I put advertise the property. I bring someone over to see the property. And the renter says, uh, I extended my lease by two years. Why are you here? OK. So that duplication of data is not very good. OK. Because you may forget to update it in all the places that need to be updated. So that's another drawback of the file-based approach. Incompatible file formats. So we all know, well, those of you who've had Dr. Plank all know how much he loves C++. Oh, wait a moment. That doesn't sound right. That's right. He hates C++ and loves C. So let's say that Dr. Plank is running the leasing office, right? I know that's, but let's just say it. So Dr. Plank is a C guy, okay? And so all his stuff is in C. And let's say I'm running the sales office and I decide that C++ is really where it's at, so I do it in C++. Well, in this case, the file formats probably aren't incompatible, but you're starting to get the point. Maybe I decide instead I'm going to use Python. <laughs> okay? Now the file formats might be different. Okay? So it may be hard to combine the information from different departments because they're in different formats. So that was a problem with just using flat files. Then you get a nice thing called data dependence, which is that the physical structure of the file is built into your program. If the records say that the address is 40 characters long, then you have to build that information into your application program. And if later we change the strings to be 60 characters long, then we have to go back and modify all the programs. Now, if you're a programmer, this is great. Okay, that's called job security. And we all love job security. Okay, but <coughs> sad to say, not everyone wants to pay us the big bucks to do all this. They kind of like to save money. So while we kind of like this idea of having physical dependence in our programs because it's good for job security, most people don't like that. So in fact, databases have a way of making at least the 
queries that users run independent of the actual physical structure of the file. So if the physical structure of the file changes, the user doesn't care. But under the old file format, my gosh, in case some physical structure changes, it's a big issue. Okay, here's another problem. Also good for our job security, but bad for the business, which is that anytime we want a new report, then unless the salesperson or the leasing person happens to have taken a a uh, few programming courses, they're probably not going to be able to write the code to create the report they want, which means they got to set up some time with the data processing department and we'll send over a programmer and see what their needs are. And maybe in a couple months after we've worked off our backlog, we'll get around to the report. Oh, that's right. It was due this week, not in two months. That's tough. Too bad. But that's the problem with the file format or the just flat file approach is that every time you need a new report basically you need a application programmer to write it for you which comes leads us to six the inability to generate timely reports because maybe the data processing department is backed up when you want that report and maybe you just want it right on the spot Okay, and you can't obviously get that even if the person is quick on the turnaround. So for all these reasons, um, by basically the late 60s, it had become pretty apparent that just having these flat files wasn't any good. So in fact, there still are these kind of flat files. They're just buried in the bowels of the Oracle SQL system or the Microsoft system. And there are a few programmers in the world who work for Oracle or who work for Microsoft who actually do deal with the details of opening and closing these files. And yes, they do work with flat files and the stuff that you work with, except they work with binary encoded files, not with text files for the most part. However, database management systems have pretty much done away with the need for programmers to deal with files unless you're dealing with kind of smaller projects. So if you're working on someone's research project, yes, there's a good chance you're dealing with just text files. But in the real world, in the business world, it'd be pretty surprising if you're working with anything other than some kind of database. Okay, so that said, what made databases so wonderful. What advantages do they confer? So the big one is flexibility for the end user. That means that the end user is able to write their own reports. And the way they write their own reports is by writing their own queries. So here's one in which what we want is to obtain the information about the names of the clients that live in Joe Keel's property. So Joe Keel is one of our owners. We'd like to know who is renting from Joe. And this is a SQL query that could be written. Now I know that off the top of your head this may look a little odd, but I bet even not having seen SQL syntax, you can have a general idea of what this query is saying. So we care about the client's first and last name, so select the client's first and last name from these particular files, the client file, the private owner file, the property for rent and the lease, okay, where, so we want the clients that live in Joe Keel's property, so we're looking for the owner who is John, or sorry, Joe Keel, and his owner number is associated with the property for rent. So presumably for each property for rent, we have Joe Keel's owner number. And that property then is being leased because some of Joe Keel's properties may be vacant. So we only care about the properties that are currently leased. And finally, we use the lease to locate the client's 
client number, and from that we can extract the client's first and last name. So we'll get into more details about this syntax in another week or so, but even so, this is a syntax that non-programmers have can master. Okay, it has in the real world there are plenty of people that are able to write these queries. They're not programmers. Okay, so the database management system is responsible for taking this query, compiling it, and figuring out what specific set of file operations it should perform in order to return this information. And then it actually tends to return it in a fairly nicely formatted report. So the user specifies what they want. The database management system figures out how to do it. So the user says what they want. Oh, man. This is totally broken now. I just can't do it. OK, I have to do it on the board. So the user says what they want. And the DBMS figures out how to make it happen, how to fulfill the request. Okay, and that is a very interesting thing, how to fulfill the request, but again, we will not have time to talk about that in this class. There's a lot of research that's gone into efficient query algorithms, and in fact, the adoption of database, relational database systems languished for about 10 years until they were able to develop sufficiently uh, fast algorithms for doing this query optimization because what the user says may not provide a lot of um, good indication of how that request should be fulfilled. Okay, so control of data redundancy. So relational database theory has come up with theoretical ways that you can decompose a file so that you don't store data redundantly. So that, for example, salary, instead of being stored in maybe two different files, might only be stored in one file. So as an example, we might store the information about how much a property is being rented for in the property for rent table and not put it in the lease table because we can always get it from the property for rent table or vice versa. So databases give us a way to decompose files and actual algorithm will actually have algorithms that show you how to decompose a file so that you don't have redundant data. Okay, then by Eliminating redundancy, you ensure data integrity, such as not duplicating salaries or having two different salaries for the same person. Because you centralize the data in a single repository, it becomes a lot easier to share the data. So instead of each department having its own particular server with its own file system, the data is put in a central place. So data sharing is more simple. We have decreased maintenance costs because someone else has spent all the heavy lifting writing the programs. That would be the people at Oracle or at Microsoft. So we can, as users, very easily write queries. And since the physical structure is not hardwired in the application program, we can easily change the query never worry about how the underlying physical structure is set up. Okay, because the data is centralized, it's easier to do backups. Okay, because it's all in one place. Security is easier to enforce because file access goes to one central location. What's the drawback of that? Pardon? single point of failures, yep, so if your thing goes down, the whole database is inaccessible. So if Amazon's database goes down, the whole site is inaccessible possibly for a few hours, where as if it was distributed across multiple 
um, departments. Only one department might be at, impact it. What's another problem with the central location? Yes. Yes, we put everything in the same honey pot. So we also made it easier for a hacker once they break your security. So it's a lot easier to guard if we only have to build one fort. We can put up a lot of defenses around our fort. But if our fort gets penetrated, then it's a lot easier to get all our information out of there. So it's both good and bad. This is what's often called the dialectic. So your strength is your weakness. Okay. Um, it's easier to do concurrency because everything is in a central location. That makes it easier to control access to your different files. So you can put locks on files to um, control access. You can put it on certain parts of a file. But having them all in a central location makes it easier to decide when you should lock and when you shouldn't. Okay, so they also have some disadvantages. They are expensive. These are very complicated pieces of software. And we can't simply hire an application programmer to row our own. Much as we might like it, we pretty much are going to have to buy it from a vendor like Oracle or Microsoft. Or you might be able to get it in the public domain, which is what we do. We're too poor to afford to buy an Oracle SQL server, so we use MySQL. And actually, as you will find out as the semester progresses, some things that are in the SQL standard are simply not supported by MySQL. And part of that reason is it takes a lot of effort to support the entire standard. So you're going to have to pony up some money for it. And because they're so general, they do tend to require more hardware. And they're bigger than if you rolled your own. If you rolled your own, you could probably streamline it, make it run faster on less hardware and not take up as much space, but because it's a general solution, you're going to have to probably buy more disk space and more hardware. Okay, same thing. I could probably do something by hand more quickly than the optimizer can because I might use domain-specific knowledge to go faster. This was pointed out, there's a greater impact of a failure, either because we physically fail and the server goes down, or because our security defenses fail and someone breaks through. And more recently, this has become a big it. Whoops, I don't want to copy that. The big issue is the data must be structured. So there's a lot of data that doesn't conform so well to this, where you might have different types of objects or that have different sets of properties. So in C, you have unions, where you have the same um, space and memory, but it has several different formats. Or with C++, you define an inheritance hierarchy where you have subclasses, OK? And they can have different characteristics. Well, most databases don't handle those cases very well. So there's certainly been a lot of research into alternative kinds of databases, object databases or something called NoSQL. We won't be going into those in this class simply because we don't have time to do so. So we will be assuming in this class that the data is well structured and that we can organize it into a set of tables. Hold on, I'll get you. So we'll assume that we can get it into a set of tables. And also, it is still the most commonly used type of database. Hence, what we will be going over. Yes? So there's two ways. One way is you can force it. There are ways that you can force unstructured data into a structured format and then use a database to deal with it. Um, you can use something like a markup language, like XML, and deal with it that way. Because XML is actually a very nice way of structuring unstructured data. It's more flexible, but it's slower. 
And then there are things like object databases that are out there that allow you to handle unstructured data more easily. So, um, okay. So, uh, that takes care of it. Um, Tuesday, we start diving into the meat of things. And as I said, you don't have to worry about homework assignments yet for a couple weeks. So I'll see you Tuesday and have a good weekend. Hilarious note. Uh, SQL